Hello, I am Dr. Prakash Didwania, Professor of Medicine from University of California, San Francisco. And it's my pleasure here to really start this conversation with Masters in Cardiology at this uh, occasion of the first World Congress of Cardiometabolic Disorders. I must congratulate you know, Dr. Manoria for organizing it because both heart disease as well as diabetes, we have the dubious distinction of having India being the capital for both of these disorders. And clearly, in the coming years, these conditions are going to have a significant not only public health impact, but economic impact on our country, unless we do something to control this epidemic. And I think clearly this epidemic can be controlled at various levels. And I have the pleasure of introducing my good friend, collaborator, and colleague, Dr. Rajiv Gupta, who is a preeminent uh, preventive cardiologist in this country. We have done the work together on the famous India Heart Watch study. And we're going to talk about what can we do to prevent this epidemic of cardiometabolic disorders in our country. Rajiv, what will be your opinion about what can be done? When should we begin? I mean, obviously, we can begin at the primordial prevention. That's where it should all begin. But it's easier said than done. What's your advice? Uh, three ways of preventing heart disease. And I think I agree with you that it is the most common cause of mortality in our country huge disease burden. We just looked at the global burden of disease data also, and what we saw was, at, as compared to countries like the China or the US, we have much more burden per person, even more than China, despite we have a slightly lesser population. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Uh, I have a very strong belief that uh, we have examples in front of us. Primordial prevention works the best. Because if you can control the risk factors, if you can improve the lifestyle, if you can take care of the children and the young people, smoking, healthy diet, exercise, uh, all these things really matter. And I think that is the way to go. Technology, yes, you could do lots of uh, things with blood pressure. You could do lots of things with diabetes, with lipids. But then there is only a, something that you can do. You can do the whole. You can right. achieve the whole burden decline with those technologies. I mean, an, an example. Uh, you are aware that in U.S. there has been a 60 percent decline in heart disease in the last uh, 30 years, but the decline is almost 90 percent in Finland, 90 right. percent in, uh, in the Scandinavian countries in Western Europe. So I think there is something else going on beyond clinical care in those countries. Well, I think one of the things that's going on in countries like Scandinavian countries, Finland, is people can walk. There are walkways in every part of Finland. I've been there. Yeah. People can walk in the shopping area. People can walk in the neighborhoods and all that. In India today, if you were to go out walk in Mumbai, you get killed. Mm -hmm. So I think right. clearly we need a major public health intervention where the facilities are made aware, uh, available to the public where they can go for healthy walk. I know that people who have luxury of going in the cars to the park and or go by the ocean side and walk, but there's only few people. So clearly we need that. And I think your emphasis on primordial prevention is fantastic because in India, there is a significant increase in childhood obesity. We have teenagers, as we showed in the India Heart Watch study, that not only have overweight and obesity, about 30% of them, but they already have prehypertension. And we used to call that prehypertension. Today, there will be hypertension with the new guidelines. Yep. So, so many of these children are already developing this problem. And unless we start with interventions at the primordial level, we'll never catch up with this epidemic that's going on. I totally agree with you that we need to be very focused on uh, prevention. And it has to come as a policy change. Unfortunately, uh, till the last 50 years of uh, following our independence, none of the governments were keen on health. Only in the last 10 years or so, they have started focusing on health as a policy issue. And I think two things have emerged out of it. Number one is we are trying to strengthen our primary care, but that is primary prevention. There is not primordial prevention. Right. Because at primary care, you can do just screening for blood pressure, screening for lipids, screening for sugar. But there is primary. Primordial, people have to think health in all policies. And I think that's what WHO also says, that unless we do 
health in all policies approach, things are not going to succeed. We need to create roads, we need to create good, I mean unpolluted cities, we need to create unpolluted villages, Swach Bharat Abhiyan or whatever you have, you call it, you may mm -hmm. call it yeah. whatever by, by whatever name you want to do, but I think we need to create health in all policies, we have to have good quality food, we need to promote healthy food, we need to promote active lifestyle, we need to have checks on smoking, on tobacco, we need to have check on pollutants, food pollutants for Absolutely, example. Absolutely, yes. Which are a very important cause of all these uh, problems. So I think we need to focus on all policies and once we have achieved that or once we go side by side with the primary prevention that is controlling risk factors, this will be important. No, I think this is particularly important now that we are fortunate that the current government has uh, sort of mobilized forces and have quote unquote universal health co coverage. But this is not going to go anywhere because the expenditure is humongous. One yes. doesn't realize it. However, the government has not spent enough money for preventive measures, whether it is uh, educating the school children, educating the lay public about the preventive health measures. And the message to the policymakers that I would have, and I'm sure you would agree, is that we should focus also on the preventive efforts because clearly we cannot have all of the Indian subjects undergo angioplasty where, I mean, there's a rush for angioplasty. You look at the hospitals, they're growing like anything. And there are hospitals that are doing angioplasty, there are hospitals that are doing the modern procedures, whether you call them towers or what have you, bypass surgery, but that's not the answer. The answer is to prevent the disease. Yes, if you cannot have the primordial prevention, at least primary prevention, as you said, works very well, and that is one of the major reasons the cardiovascular mortality in the United States and other developed countries have decreased. I think it's time for us in our country to also have the instrumentation and implementation of those guidelines. And unless the government part participates in that, along with the people who are interested in it, we are not going to win this battle. Uh, I will add one component, which I think nobody talks about, is the medical education. Yes. We need to be very proactive in providing our medical uh, education curriculum on prevention. Absolutely. Unfortunately, it's all didactic, it's all hospital based, and in hospitals you don't pra practice preventive medicine. Right. Uh, it is only in primary healthcare centers, it has the district healthcare centers, you can, pre and uh, that's what you do. I mean, when I was in the medical college, uh, nobody talked of hypertension. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody talked of lipids. It's, it's not sexy. It's not sexy, that's <laughs> right. We'll, we'll see mil uh, thousands of patients of mitral stenosis or rheumatic heart disease or well, uh, congenital heart disease. In real life, uh, you don't see that many. You may no. see one or two Absolutely. patients of congenital heart disease a month. You may now, see most a people in India are now dying of ischemic heart disease and hypertensive that's heart that's disease, right. not of rheumatic heart disease. So I think clearly we need to focus on that. You're absolutely right. Unless we begin with public health policy and education in the medical curriculum and also incentives. I mean, the other thing is, like any other profession, if the medical professionals don't have incentives to practice preventive cardiology, they're not going to do that. They're right now, they're interested in angioplasty because that's a financially driven motive. Yeah. Clearly, if you spend half hour talking to a patient how to prevent their diabetes, how to take the medication to control blood pressure and control their lipids, you get not rewarded for that at all. The, even right. the patient themselves, yeah. their mentality will be, okay, uh, so I think clearly the whole gamut has to change. And that needs to be beginning at the top and also at the root levels, which is clearly patients, their care providers or their caretakers, as well as the our growing doctors today. Yeah, even apart from young doctors, I think if we can train or educate or create a post of heart disease preventive nurses, preven prevention technicians, or prevention other people, you not only give them employment, but they also give a very uh, substantial contribution to these yeah, that's, things. Yeah, that's what we do in the United States. Yeah. In my clinics, we have nurse practitioners, physician assistant, and even pharmacists, clinical pharmacists yes. that are educating for these preventive measures. So clearly, yes. physicians don't have enough time and clearly this can be done. This is a 
this is not a rocket science. We can set up the protocols. These people can clearly spend time with them. And another advantage of having these paramedical personnel is patients feel more comfortable with these people rather than with doctors. Doctors are somewhat intimidating, if you will. Patient will not be open with their opinions, with asking questions. So I think that is very, very critical. Let me switch gear and ask you a burning question, and that is, nobody hesitates in this country to spend whatever, five lakhs, four lakhs, to get their angioplasty. But you talk to them about preventive measures, you talk to them about controlling their blood pressure or controlling their cholesterol, et cetera, they are not really very impressed with you. They will go to another doctor who will tell them, yeah, yeah, angioplasty on a What is the message? I mean, clearly, we, you and I both agree, and both of us have written about it. We certainly have uh, propagandized this message in the United States that not every patient with coronary artery disease, particularly stable coronary artery disease, needs angiogram or angioplasty. That is something that is not indicated in 90% of the patients. And yet patients themselves will ask, Doc, sab aap kuch nahi aur kuch nahi karenge kya? Mera angiogram ka kya? Well, once they do the angiogram, then they have what I call oculostenotic reflex. They see a stenosis. Even if the doctor say, no, no, you don't need the intervention, patient will say, no, no, no please do it, because I, I'm scared. The family will say, can you fix it? How can we convey the message that these interventions, in most cases, are not necessary? Uh, yeah, uh, one, uh, there are two approaches to the whole problem. One is at the uh, physician level, we need to be more educated. We can use technology to decide or to discuss what's going to benefit. Absolutely. And the second thing is I think every 90% blockage may not produce symptoms, Absolutely. may not be in a long run beneficial. And uh, now there are clear guidelines that unless a person has acute infarction, right. which is know. a definite indication for angioplasty or... Spending. That's already late. We yes. are talking about before that. Once yeah. you have a heart attack, the ball game is over as far as I'm so, concerned. So I think we need to be sure of that. Uh, the second thing is the development of confidence in the health system, Absolutely. which is uh, missing right now in this country, uh, maybe all over the world, but... Well, part of, of it is distrust. Distrust, yeah. You know, patients don't trust because then they get this thing, they go to a doctor, one doctor says, yes, you need to get angioplasty or what a bypass surgery. The other doctor says, you don't need it. Patients are confused. They go to a third opinion, and whatever the third person says, they say, okay, two doctors have said this. That may be the right thing to do. And then they get this, and they, some of them don't even get relief of their angina or their symptoms. And they say, why did I get this procedure? Uh, uh, will, you, will you do something more beyond a simple locator stenotic reflex? reflex or have you some technology to answer that question? That's number one. So I think I will ask you that question that yeah. can technology help there? Second thing is uh, after this famous Orbita, although a very small trial, yes. yeah. showing clearly that uh, you don't always get benefit if you, even if you open up yeah. the arteries. So what is your comment on that? No, I think first of all, the technology is developing very fast. So now we have non-invasive ways of detecting coronary artery disease. I still do not do that because still the ocular stenotic reflex is going to be there. But I use it particularly when patients are not convinced to take the preventive measures that are essential. Then I have a CT scan or even CT angiography to show to the patient, look, you already have the disease here. We can prevent the progression of the disease or the devastating effect of the disease by showing them the picture. So clearly, picture is worth a thousand words. Whatever we can say, picture can convey it much more convincingly. And then I start still with my basic pharmacologic and lifestyle interventions, which are effective in 90% of the patient. If that's not enough, patient has a lot of symptoms despite medical <laughs> therapy, yes, there is no harm. Then clearly, there are interventions that are safe, that can be done, but that's in a minority of the patients, not every patient that come across us. So I think that's very, very important to keep in mind. In terms of Let's say if somebody has gone already for angiography, we now have techniques in angiography that we can do the flow measurements. That will tell you that what we see in two-dimensional, just the stenosis, is not enough. By measuring the flow, there have, there have been large studies, FAME 1, FAME 2 studies that have been done that have shown that unless you have 80% or greater reduction in flow, 
there may not be any benefit of dilating or revascularizing such areas and this is very important and clinical practice has shown that if you properly do the flow measurement, FFR we call it, then about 70 percent of the procedures we do are unnecessary. Most of the stenotic lesions are not that uh, flow limiting. Yeah, I'll agree there. Uh, but I think what we need to emphasize again is that many patients who undergo angioplasties or bypass surgeries do not stick to their lifestyle, Absolutely. healthy lifestyles, do not stick to their drugs. So I think uh, it's a very important component, secondary prevention, and we need to be aware that the disease is lifelong and the treatment is lifelong. So what do you think of that? Well, well, not only that, another very important point to emphasize to the patients and the physician alike is you may fix one lesion, but that artery has many other lesions that may not be obstructive. And these lesions are the lesions that are going to cause the future heart attack, so-called the vulnerable plaque. And these are the plaques that may not be stenotic, but they are rich in lipid. And those plaques can be only stabilized by aggressively intensifying the lipid lowering therapy, so-called the cholesterol lowering therapy, which we have many safe drugs available now. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it requires lifestyle interventions as well. And I agree with you. One of the reasons why many people will get expensive intervention, but they don't stick with the medication, or the physicians even fail to prescribe the right kind of medication. So all of these are major limitations. And one should really be cognizant of the fact that even after you get the intervention, you need to change your lifestyle. You need to also reduce your cholesterol, control your blood pressure, have the right kind of medication that are quote unquote cardioprotective. So I think there is a tremendous amount of message. We are very fortunate in 2019 that we have so many drugs that are very effective in preventing heart attack, in also reducing the critical risk factors, and yet we are not using them. And this has yeah. been shown. I, the trial, you are aware, the Freedom trial that was done, the angioplasty trial, supported by National Institute of Health. In that study, three of the risk factors, the blood pressure, the lipids, and I believe uh, blood pressure, lipids, and control of glucose, that was only attained in less than 20% of the patients. Yeah. And yet they had undergone multiple angioplasties with the stenting and all that. So I think the message is clear that everybody has to make concerted efforts to modify the risk factors. And the studies have now shown that when you do comprehensive risk reduction, even in a diabetic patient, you can reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, and other complications by half or even more. I totally agree with you. I think. We need to focus. Uh, we need to focus beyond expensive technologies. We need to focus beyond uh, the practice of so-called sexy medicine. We right. need to be very pragmatic. First is prevention of heart disease. So I think policy issues are very clear. Very clear. But I think very important thing is to control your blood pressure to the right kind of levels. Important thing is to control your cholesterol to right levels. Control your triglycerides need a healthy lifestyle, right, eat right kind of food. And, and I do think regular activity. I do regular activity. What, it doesn't need to be a gym. It doesn't need to be jogging. It could be just brisk walking for 30 to 35 minutes five times a week. That's what the American Heart Association recommends, yeah. which is easy to do. But of yeah. course, you can't do it in cities like Mumbai. You can't walk outside this hotel. You'll be killed. So I think <laughs> we need the walkways where people can have it. But in the meantime, you find your ways to do whatever you can till the government and the public health uh, people create these walkways or healthy neighborhoods, if you will. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, I, I think the other message we will have here, this Congress is focused on diabetes. Let's talk about diabetes. I mean, people blame families. People say, oh, I have bad genes. It's not the genes. If anything, those who even have history of family, familial history of diabetes, it's the gene environment interaction which plays a role. So somebody who has very strong family of diabetes can still prevent him or herself from having diabetes if they, instrument, if they utilize proper lifestyle interventions starting from the early stage. One, can they? Yeah, I think <clears throat> we need to understand that heart disease and diabetes are almost the same kind of epidemic. Absolutely. They are twin, twins yes. in, in real terms. Uh, both can be prevented. Both can be prevented using the same policy measures that we use for 
heart disease can also be used for diabetes. Important thing is the physical activity. And I think that is critical in our country also because we get, tend to get central obesity and the only treatment for central obesity is more physical activity. Right. So we need to promote physical activity at work while commuting. We don't need to sit for a long time talking. We need to be more active. We need to talk. We need to walk around. So I think that's one thing which is very important. People say that even if you have a job that requires sitting, getting up every half an hour, and just taking a short walk within the office could be yeah. enough. Yeah, that's you know, right. if you do it every half hour. So I, there is no excuse. It doesn't need to be vigorous physical activity. Any kind of what we call move, movement, any yeah. kind of movement is better than just sitting idly. Uh, isn't that? Uh, yeah. And people say, why is the heart disease increasing these days? Well, because if we go to our ancestors, everybody used to walk to the center of town in the evening. Nobody walks nowadays unless they are particular about it. People just sit down in front of the tube, the television, or the young kids sit in front of the computer or their video games. Those are the main reasons why we have these epidemics of diabetes and also the epidemic of heart disease. We must get up and move. Move, move. move movement is very, very critical. And as you said, physical activity is probably essential to prevent these epidemics of both heart disease yeah. and diabetes. I think it's been clearly shown that even if you are prone genetically to develop heart disease or diabetes and you lead a very active lifestyle, you can prevent them. Absolutely. So it really is re really helpful. So one is healthy lifestyle and physical activity, tobacco, smoking, pollutants, uh, healthy food are very important. Absolutely. I, I, I think you have emphasized that lifestyle, therapeutic lifestyle interventions or just living. I always say, for lack of any better analogies, if we live our life like a villager lives right now, you can avoid most of these diseases of civilization. I always tell people when they ask me what sort of diet I should have, I said, eat, eat like a poor villager. Eat the grains, the, the raw grains, with minimal kind of saturated fat, with the, you know, clearly eating that kind of food, the natural grains that are so plentiful available in this country. Eat at least five vegetables or fruit every day, and you will find that your risk of diabetes and heart disease can be substantially reduced. It cannot be eliminated. If you have genetic predisposition, you may need some treatment. But that is not to say that across the board, these lifestyle interventions will not work. Even in people who are genetically predisposed, as you just said, lifestyle interventions could be significantly effective. Yeah, uh, and I think we everybody talks about food. so. Trans fats are very important. Absolutely. I think there is no issue. We all talk of saturated fat, unsaturated, and we forget trans fat, yes. Yes, absolutely. The World Health Organization has just issued an appeal to the governments to ban trans fats from the production cycle. So I think it's very important. And, and we have now bans in many cities in the United States. New York City banned it five years ago, and they have seen a significant decrease in the atherogenic lipid profile of patients, etc. We will see whether that translates into decrease in risk of heart attack, but I think these measures have to be taken. And this is very important because the pre-processed food, like the candies, the cakes, the pastry, they all use trans fats. And That's they, how the, <laughs> these products are made. Uh, so it's not only the Western fast foods, it's also yeah. the Indian fast oh, foods. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Which are also high in trans fats. So I think right. we forget, we always try to blame Western fast foods that cakes and pastries and pizzas, these things are bad. No, it is also the Indian fast foods. Yeah. Well, we when, our samosas and when we deep fry, this all becomes trans fat. So, right. And fortunately, I must say that there is awareness of this. You can now find baked foods if you so desire. They are a little bit more expensive because there is not a volume sales. But clearly, if people are conscious and more people contribute to uh, using those things, they will become cheaper and they are more healthier. So with that, I think, I'd like to thank you, Rajiv. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you about the preventive health measures at this first cardiometabolic uh, congress in Mumbai organized by Dr. Manoria. And I think this congress is emphasizing the preventive measures as well as the use of newer drugs that are cardioprotective and prevent the complications of diabetes, particularly as it focuses on heart diseases. Thank you very much for your attention.